different disease, but it, there's, a, there's a, uh, enough cases out there that uh, this procedure should be uh, more widely applied. Now, there's a progression from uh, acute PE to chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. We know that uh, emboli that become persistent uh, can entrap uh, circulating stem cells. Uh, there can be misguided proliferation of cells, uh, which lead to vascular remodeling and chronic obstruction, resulting in uh, the ravages of pulmonary hypertension. So this is our deep venous thrombus. Um, this is a, often a presentation where we see a CT scan that uh, show a patient with a large uh, burden of emboli in the, in the pulmonary arteries. And uh, if we follow these patients uh, further up, we can uh, do further tests. This is a ventilation perfusion scan, which uh, reveals uh, absence of uh, perfusion to the right lung with uh, normal ventilation. Uh, large perfusion defects also in the uh, um, left lower lobe. A dual energy CT scan with iodine mapping can also give very similar information. You can see the, uh, the absence of uh, perfusion in the right lung here with no, uh, fairly normal perfusion, some defects in the, in the lower lobe still. A new, uh, new modality that's uh, become available to us. Now, if we perform pulmonary thromboendarterectomy surgery, we can remove a cast of the thrombus that looks like this and open up the uh, pulmonary arteries uh, re-establishing flow into the lung, which fortunately has a dual blood supply and therefore can participate once more in uh, gas exchange. So this is uh, our case again that we uh, showed earlier on. Um, you can see the absence of perfusion. This is shortly after the surgery and now you can see there's perfusion in the right lung after removing um, this uh, thrombus. Here is the complete obstruction, uh, some occlusions in the lower lobe here and that matches our uh, specimen that we've removed. So we know that approximately 95% of uh, acute PEs would uh, resolve and you will not have any hemodynamic compromise. But uh, there are factors, genetic or intrinsic variables in patients that uh, um, also pro-thrombotic uh, tendencies uh, or recurrent pulmonary emboli that can lead to the development of uh, small vessel disease and progressive more small vessel disease and leading to chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. We know that there are certain comorbid states that uh, predisposes patients more to develop this and we know that the odds ratio for malignancy, uh, antiphospholipid syndrome, for previous uh, history of venal thromboembolism uh, or thyroid hormone replacement uh, splenectomy and infected pacemaker leads or VA shunts has a significant increase in the risk for developing uh, uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. We see that the age distribution is a little bit different to that of primary pulmonary hypertension, which normally occurs in the second, third, uh, fourth decade. Uh, chronic thromboembolic disease is seen more commonly in the fifth and the sixth decade. Although we do have patients from as young as five years old, up to our oldest patient was 87. So if we uh, look at epidemiologic studies, we can uh, assume, and this is using data from US and Italy, that the, there's approximately 200 uh, cases of uh, acute pulmonary emboli that is definitely confirmed as large acute pulmonary emboli. And uh, if you take a, a range of um, around 1 to 4% uh, developing uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, we know that we should be doing approximately 1,600 to even as high as 7,000 uh, cases per year in the United States. But currently, there's only about 300 PTE surgeries being performed in the United States. So it's, a, it's widely uh, underdiagnosed, underrecognized, and uh, surgery is not often frequently enough. What is the natural history of uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension? So also from epidemiologic studies, we know that uh, the higher the mean pulmonary artery pressure, the worse the outcome. And if we have somebody with a mean pulmonary artery pressure of 50, we know that the two-year survival is less than 20%. So it's a very morbid disease. Um, like heart failure and uh, more morbid than many of the malignancies. On the right-hand pane is a, is a study uh, that was done in 2001 looking at uh, two populations. One, there was 54 total patients. 
Four <laughs> patients were offered pulmonary thrombinodrectomy surgery, and the rest were just followed. And you can see how uh, drastically the uh, survival is influenced um, by doing pulmonary thrombinodrectomy surgery versus uh, just um, leaving the patient trying medical therapy. So we have a good solution. How would these patients clinically present to us? Typically with progressive dyspnea, uh, chronic cough. Uh, they might experience uh, chest pain when they exert themselves, climbing up a flight of stairs, complaining of chest pain. Um, lower extremity edema is usually when they've already developed right heart failure. Uh, Presyncope and syncope, this is an obstructive lesion, limits the cardiac outflow. If a patient has a demand uh, increase and he cannot meet this demand increase, they can, have, they can syncopize. Hemoptysis is seen frequently as the patient develops bronchial collaterals. These are small, thin vessel, high pressure uh, uh, arteries that can uh, rupture and bleed, lead to hemoptysis. Um, and it's important to remember that there's no history of DVT or PE in uh, up to 30% of our uh, patients. If you examine them, you'll find that they have an increased uh, P2 sound. There will be an RV tap and a lift. Um, you can get a narrowed fixed splitting of the second heart sound. Tricuspid regurg murmur can be heard when they develop significant pulmonary hypertension. And uh, elevated JVD, hepatomegaly is seen, ascites can be seen, and peripheral edema. And the unique thing is if you listen over the lung fields, you can often hear the bruit of the turbulent flow going through the obstructions uh, left by the uh, chronic clot. In the differential diagnosis, there are a variety of things that we have to consider. Primary arterial pulmonary hyperten uh, arterial hypertension, um, then also uh, COPD. And these can also mimic CTEF, developing uh, inside to thrombus. And I'll show a couple of slides uh, about this. Fibrosing mediastinitis, uh, pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, more commonly seen uh, after EP procedures for pulmonary vein isolation can cause uh, uh, obstruction or fibrosis that leads to a pulmonary venous occlusive disease. Uh, pulmonary vein stenosis, congenital, uh, uh, extrinsic vascular compression, sarcoidosis is one of the diseases that can compress large uh, lymph nodes that can compress uh, the pulmonary arteries. Uh, large vessel vasculitis is another um, differential diagnosis that has to be considered. Congenital branch stenosis and then pulmonary artery sarcoma can mimic uh, chronic thromboembolic disease very well. And they, they, they also have a similar surgery. We, we performed endarterectomy for the sarcoma patients as well. Here's an example of, uh, of a vasculitis case. And it, it would look as if maybe there's chronic clot with a little bit of recanalization, but you can see these vessels are long and narrow and uh, diffusely diseased. And this patient actually had a, a vasculitis and uh, had vasculitis in, in other organs as well. If you do a CT scan of the aorta, this patient had a, a, a aortic vasculitis as well. So the guidelines for our diagnostic workup, we have these symptoms, we uh, develop a suspicion, we examine the patient and we think, well, maybe the patient has uh, pulmonary hypertension. We do an echocardiogram that uh, we, we test and see if there's uh, evidence of pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular enlargement. And uh, then we uh, would do a next test. And typically, after the echocardiogram, it would be a VQ scan, would be a good one to do. Nowadays, there's a lot of CT imaging being done before a VQ scan. It's just more freely available. And there are distinct features on CT scans that can lead you to believe that you are dealing with chronic thromboembolic disease. If the VQ scan is completely stone cold normal, then you can just rule out CTEF and work up for other causes of pulmonary arterial hypertension. If the C uh, VQ scan shows mismatch perfusion defects, you have to consider and contemplate is this uh, CTEF. And you should refer the patient to a PH or a CTEF center of expertise with expertise to uh, work these patients up further. Typically in our institution, the patient will undergo a right heart catheterization and a pulmonary angiogram or a CT pulmonary angiogram. And, uh, where we can confirm the diagnosis. So here we have a completely normal perfusion scan. This is not CTIP. This is the defects that we see, and this patient should be worked up for CTIP. Let's do a case study. 
So this is a 48-year-old uh, woman. She comes to us in functional class 3, maybe going on to class 4. Uh, she has no history of DVT. She had an echo with the uh, findings of pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular hypertrophy. And you can see this on her uh, chest X-ray as well, that she has uh, enlarged pulmonary arteries and right ventricular enlargement. She was started on an out, at an outside hospital with the trial of sildenafil, uh, but she had no subjective uh, improvement. Resting sinus tachycardia, she had an elevated JVD, a right ventricular heave, uh, she had a RS3, and her liver was at uh, 6 centimeters with uh, some edema, so a pretty sick patient. This is her echocardiogram, and uh, the outstanding features here is a very large right atrium, an enlarged right ventricle, a D-shaped uh, left ventricle with pressure overload, and then the uh, velocity through the tricuspid valve indicating high pulmonary artery pressure or high right ventricular pressure. It, uh, received a VQ scan, and here you can see multiple uh, moth-eaten-like appearance, uh, multiple perfusion defects um, with normal ventilation. In our hospital, she uh, had a uh, pulmonary angiogram. We use biplane uh, pulmonary angiogram, so we have lateral and AP. And uh, here you can see there are uh, definitely um, defects, uh, filling defects. Um, there are webs. Um, there are abrupt cutoffs. Uh, there are hypoperfused lung, where you can see that there's just not much perfusion into the lung. Um, and then filling defects. Typically, the disease is more in the right lung than in the left lung. And it's typically more in the lower lobes than in the upper lobes. This is a, a CT scan of this patient, which uh, demonstrates uh, mosaicism. So uh, areas of uh, <coughs> hypoperfusion where uh, there's obstructed uh, blood flow within areas of normal perfusion. Um, CT angiogram is, uh, is capable of uh, picking up some of the defects. There you can see a web that's uh, in the pulmonary artery and uh, some filling. A couple of things about CT that I want to make statements to. One is the absence of proximal clot on the CT angiogram does not rule out surgical accessible CTF for the most part. And the presence of central thrombus on a CT does not confirm the diagnosis of uh, CTF either. Here we can see a patient with uh, acute clot um, very clearly visible, the, the features of an acute pulmonary embolism. And a year later, there's a tiny little, a very uh, subtle change that uh, might be construed as even a, a branch point. But this is the, the organized thrombus that uh, is, becomes very subtle. So um, not so easy to diagnose chronic state uh, with a CT scan. Another giveaway that you might be dealing with uh, chronic thromboembolic disease is uh, mediastinal collaterals. And here you can see around the airways, the body is trying to just get blood flow to, uh, to come into the lung, and uh, you get uh, mediastinal collaterals that uh, is prominent. Also, vessel asymmetry. Uh, clearly, there's more vessels on this side than on, on this side, uh, most probably a proximal obstruction to uh, leave a pattern like this. This is a case of uh, insight to thrombus, and if you look here, you can clearly see the, the clots here, and, uh, but if you look at the VQ scan, it's a completely normal VQ scan. If you take this patient to the operating room, you won't make any change to the patient's condition. You would just give them a sternotomy and, and uh, potential risk for complications, but there won't be any benefit uh, here. This is an insight to thrombus that developed in a patient with, with uh, arterial uh, pulmonary hypertension. So this is the hemodynamics from our patient. Uh, she had, had a right heart cath, the RA pressure is 26, pulmonary artery pressure 90 over 35, mean of 57, wedge pressure 16, cardiac output 2.5, and a pulmonary vascular resistance of 1,294, and pulmonary artery saturation was 43%. There were multiple segmental level disease, as we've already shown. And um, now you have to ask yourself, do the hemodynamics fit the angiography? Does the amount of pulmonary hypertension match the defects that you see because if they don't you might be dealing with arterial pulmonary hypertension on a on a capillary level that uh, won't get better from a, a, a surgery so what are the options for this patient here we can just continue with medical therapy and 
Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but there are drugs approved for uh, patients that uh, are non-surgical candidates. Um, you can do a surgical pulmonary endarterectomy, and we'll talk a little bit about operability assessment. And then b balloon pulmonary angioplasty is a, uh, a technique that's been uh, used for many years, in, especially in, in Japan, but uh, nowadays uh, being used more in the United States as well. It is an obstructive disease, and it's, uh, it's kind of counterintuitive that you can uh, use balloon pulmonary angioplasty, but uh, it definitely has a role to play, especially in the more distal disease. And then there's even talk about uh, maybe you can do pulmonary artery denervation, um, but that won't really help for an obstructive disease. The operability uh, discussion, it's kind of difficult to address. And every time we have a case, we have a multidisciplinary team that meets and we discuss the case. Um, and it's impossible to just have general guidelines that we can put out there and uh, um, put it for every uh, center to just use this. But uh, factors that would influence the decision is if there's a clear diagnosis of CTIF, if there's no clots, then there's no surgery. But if there's a clear diagnosis, then you should uh, contemplate doing the surgery. Then you look as there con comorbidities that will limit the patient's ability to gain benefit from the operation. Does he have severe COPD and you take out the clots, he's still going to be limited. Uh, most probably shouldn't do it. Is he so old and frail that he won't be able to rehabilitate after the surgery? Does he have severe kidney dis disorder? Is there other comorbidities? And then you have to look at the anatomy and the hemodynamic correlation. The, it has to match up the, how high the pulmonary artery pressure is with how much obstruction you can relieve. Then you also have to consider the surgical experience at your center, um, especially uh, do you have surgeons that are capable and, and familiar with doing very distal disease if you, if you present a case with distal disease to them. And then the center's experience, both the anesthesia, the critical care, whether they can manage these patients afterwards. <coughs> So inoperable, uh, at UCSD, about 2 to 3 percent of cases that get referred to us, we turn down for surgery. So not many patients get turned down. We don't think there's any degree of right heart failure that makes a patient inoperable. We will even take a patient on ECMO because of right heart failure to the operating room if we are sure that we have the right diagnosis, that we have operable disease. We also don't think that, uh, that there's a pulmonary hypertension grade that is so high that we would not take uh, the patient. So generally, if the etiology is thromboembolic, we would offer operation. We, I do want to mention that uh, preoperative pulmonary va uh, vascular resistance uh, is a predictor of mortality. And this is data from uh, Dartable, the, the Paris group, that uh, showed that the higher the, the uh, pulmonary artery pressures, uh, the higher the, the operative mortality. And uh, clearly, if you have patients over a 1,000, it's a, it's a fairly steep uh, angle there on the curve. So this is our uh, angiogram that we showed. This is the specimen that came out of the patient. So this is level 3, so segmental level disease. And there's multiple segments that were obstructed. And uh, this is the uh, post-operative uh, VQ scan. Um, post-operative, early post-operative, there's a lot of changes, but you can basically see some of the defects that have uh, resolved and uh, dark areas that are now bright. And there's actually some steel phenomena that uh, can happen um, in the early post-operative phase. Uh, typically, this VQ scan will become fairly homogeneous and normal uh, looking after uh, approximately three to six months. This is the post-operative echo. You can see that the, P, uh, the RV pressure is uh, markedly down now and that the uh, D shape of the left ventricle has resolved. So what are the rationale for this uh, operation? To restore perfusion to functional tissue. The tissue is functional because they have dual blood supply. They have bronchial circulation keeping the lung tissue alive. So it's not necessarily fibrosed, necrotic, or uh, scarred. The aim of the operation is threefold. First one is hemodynamic. We want to relieve the right heart failure. And the second is uh, alveolo respiratory. We want to restore vent uh, ventilation um, and uh, uh, gas exchange. And the next one is palliative. We want to prevent the progressive right ventricular failure and development of small vessel disease. 
similar to overflowing an area as a congenital case uh, with a shunt, the areas of the lung that is not obstructed is receiving a significant amount of flow and there's some evidence that there's small vessel changes happening in that uh, unobstructed uh, lung, so you want to prevent that. The surgical principles is well established. We do this operation through a median stenotomy on cardiopulmonary bypass uh, with circulatory arrest and there's a lot of debate. Everybody always asks me, why do you have to do circulatory arrest? Um, but once you do the operation, you will know why you need to do it because blood just uh, wants to get out. And if you open a pulmonary artery, that's the lowest point. It's exposed to ex atmospheric pressure and blood is coming there in your field. So you definitely do need circulatory arrest. This was definitively uh, studied by the Papworth group and they uh, basically did a randomized control trial between circulatory arrest and no circulatory arrest, and the outcomes were better in the circulatory arrest. Uh, both the neurocognitive uh, testing as well as uh, the um, reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance. You have to typically do a bilateral endarterectomy. It is very rare to get a disease that uh, obstruction that is just unilateral. Almost always there's some emboli that goes into both lungs and you should at least inspect both lungs. It's very important to identify the correct plane. The plane is in the tunica media and uh, it has to be identified to uh, make a complete endarterectomy. And you have to take all the tails out. You cannot leave some of these tails because that will still leave obstructed. So you follow each one of the tails uh, all the way distal. This is our surgical setup, and uh, the team did an excellent job yesterday. They were doing this uh, just like the book. Um, we have uh, uh, endotracheal tube, large border endotracheal tube, because you have to be able to use a diagnostic bronchoscope. TEE uh, monitoring, we use a pulmonary artery catheter. The patient has a radial arterial line and has a femoral arterial line. There's bladder and rectal temperature probes, as well as nasopharyngeal or tympanic temperature probes that we use uh, during this operation because we're going to do deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. For anesthesia, it's very important. Uh, these patients can, like a critical aortic stenosis patient on induction, can very easily arrest because it's a flow-limiting uh, uh, lesion. So target hemodynamic stability, it's based on the right ventricular function. Do not attempt to lower the pulmonary, art the, the pulmonary vascular resistance. You should attempt to ensure that you have adequate perfusion and contraction of the right ventricle, so you use inotropes. Extensive pre-oxygenation uh, of the patient, so let them uh, breathe uh, oxygen for a prolonged period of time, uh, even hyperventilate them. Then we use uh, fentanyl, midazolam, etomidate, uh, and varying doses as, muscle, as well as muscle relaxant at the time of in, uh, patient and uh, induction. It's important to select patients, if you have a really sick patient, the surgical team should be in the room, ready for going on urgently if uh, the patient decompensates. Right, so a couple of signs of impending doom. If you see on the preoperative cath that the diastolic pressure in the RV was more than 15, you should be very worried at the time of induction. This is typically a patient that's going to fail. Or if you have severe tricuspid valve regurgitation preoperatively, or if the pulmonary vascular resistance is above 1,000. Surgical team in the room, inotropes, typically dopamine, epinephrine, in line and running at the time of induction. Intraoperative TE, we use it to uh, look at the right heart chamber size, the function, um, you look for uh, abnormal motion of the intraventricular septum, uh, intracardiac shunts, uh, typically if there's a PFO, we're going to try and close it because that uh, shunting blood from right to left can cause uh, hypoxemia. Um, and identify any thrombus that might be in the right atrium in transit, you should try and remove those as well. We not infrequently see clots still attached to either the, uh, uh, the tricuspid valve or uh, even the, uh, by the IVC. So one of our intraoperative echoes, and you can see again the massive right atrium, right ventricle, squishing the left atrium and the left ventricle. Going away here, but uh, typically the same picture. Another important thing during anesthesia is to be setting up for your um, brain protection. The brain is the index organ during circulatory arrest. 
You should be monitoring this with uh, near infrared spectrometry as well as EEG monitoring to make sure that you completely suppress the EEG prior to circulatory arrest. We use this um, uh, wrap, uh, cooling wrapping uh, um, unit. It's actually originally made for knees, um, but uh, works very well. It circulates uh, uh, water at four degrees Celsius and keeps the, the head uh, very nicely cold. Uh, you can do ice packs as well, but uh, this is the way we do it. The perfusionist then uh, has to use bypass um, solutions that is uh, used for um, typically for circulatory arrest. We use plasma light, 25% albumin, mannitol and bicarbonate, uh, heparin and solimedrol in, in the prime. Um, for the neuroprotection, uh, we also, uh, for prophylaxis of seizures, we use phenytoin. Uh, intraoperatively and uh, we also give propofol immediately prior to doing the circulatory arrest uh, we administer 2.5 milligram per kilogram after completion of the endarterectomy when we start recirculating again we give methylprednisolone 500 milligrams as well as mannitol this is to try and stabilize the membranes and reduce the uh, possibility for brain edema uh, the cooling should be uniform. You're aiming for a body temperature, so core, bladder, uh, temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. Typically, the brain or tympanic temperature is sitting around 16 degrees at that point in time. Cooling usually takes around an hour, depending on body size. We maintain a gradient of uh, 10 degrees Celsius. We don't try to cool too rapidly, otherwise it won't be a uniform cooling. And then we already talked about the propofol and the methylprednisolone. We limit the deep hypothermic circulatory arrest to 20 minutes at a time. Uh, if we do that and we reperfuse after the 20 minutes, and then we can do multiple episodes of 20 minutes. And we've been as, as far out as 120 minutes of total circulatory arrest um, with uh, excellent outcomes, no neurologic uh, effect. Um, so just make sure that you remember to turn the stopcocks off when you drain the patient and you don't entrain air. Um, confirm that the head is cold, that your EEG is flat, and uh, then you try and ventilate, squeeze the blood out of the lungs prior to the surgeon starting the endarterectomy. So this is our surgical setup. Um, here we, we are cannulated. Um, we have a high ascending aorta cannulation. We have bicable cannulas with the cannula coming up into the uh, SVC. This one goes down into the IVC. We use a cooling jacket that we wrap around the heart. And then we have a retractor, a modified cerebellar retractor that opens up the space between the aorta here and the superior vena cava. And this is where you're going to approach the right pulmonary artery. And you're going to make an incision in the middle of the right pulmonary artery. After you cross clamp and you give uh, Dalnido cardioplegia is what we use. Uh, surgeon's view, now you're looking inside the pulmonary artery. And these are some of the features. You see blood coming from the bronchial circulation coming up at you still. Uh, sometimes there can be some uh, more acute thrombus. This is chronic thrombus and it layers, it forms webs. This is a lumen that should be open here, but a thrombus has gone across it and got organized and scarred it down, making two little orifices here. This is where you would hear the flow murmur as well if you examine the patient. Then this is the development of the plane. We have uh, small instruments that we lift up a plane here and we're going to dissect, get circumferential. You dissect in the media of the vessel. It usually strips fairly easily. It's a shiny, uh, uh, pearly white uh, uh, appearance and color. If it gets too pink, it means you're getting too close to the adventitia, too close to the lung tissue, and that you can uh, uh, exit the vessel. This is then looking into the pulmonary artery. You have this thrombus here. You are pushing the patient away from the thrombus, and then you are opening up, and you take each one of these branches all the way as deep as it goes. If there's a bifurcation, you make sure that you take all of the tails of the bifurcation as you dissect deeper down. This is the instruments that we use, and they, uh, these double action forceps make the uh, holding the clot much easier. This is the aspirator dissector that we use to dissect and aspirate a little elevator to start the plane and then long instruments for sewing up the pulmonary artery again. This is a video where we uh, just showing this is uh, earlier this week. Uh, this is actually a patient from Texas that uh, came to us I'm looking inside the pulmonary artery. 
This is uh, the thrombus that we see. And uh, we're going to start the dissection plane. Use the elevator. Initially, I was a little bit too deep. So I'm finding the right plane, getting in it. You can see it strips fairly easily at this point in time. And uh, we're going to, I'm cutting it off here. I'm going to do the lower and the upper lobe separately, um, trying to get a circumferential uh, specimen going and uh, then work our way into the pulmonary arteries here, each one of them individually. And eventually you can uh, uncork and uh, pull the whole uh, thrombus out of there. Going to be nice and unobstructed. Um, here we're working on the upper lobe. And uh, we, this is a little bit of a dance that you have to do with your uh, OR team here. And I have a little video that will show it there. Um, the surgeon cannot take his head away. He has to look right at the plane of dissection. Uh, he will lose time if he looks around. So the team is very important to put the instruments in his hand and uh, that the communication should be smooth. We're only limited to 20 minutes at a time to be able to uh, do the dissection. Here we're going into the left side now. A uh, surgeon stands on the uh, patient's right side, looking into the left pulmonary artery. You can see the thickening. On the left side, I often use a beaver blade, a, a knife to cut in the back part of the vessel to scrape until I get into the right plane, and then developing it circumferentially. We uh, keep dissecting down. Another specimen removed. We're looking inside, and that's very normal appearing pulmonary artery. So after the obstructions were relieved, we had a very nice uh, normal uh, pulmonary artery. When you then try to separate from bypass, you have to rewarm to a normal thermia. It typically takes up to two hours. Warming takes much longer than, uh, than the cooling. Um, you go through your checklist. Typically, we start dopamine infusion, sometimes epinephrine. Um, we use temporary pacing wires. Uh, typically, we pace the patient around 80 um, to try and help the right ventricle. You do your T assessments and uh, you check the endotracheal tube to see if there's any evidence of uh, bleeding. If there's frothy sputum or airway bleeding, you have a problem and you're going to have to deal with this. Uh, complications that can happen, reperfusion pulmonary edema, up to 30% of cases, airway bleeding. It's not that common, but if you have it, it's uh, the third most common cause of death for these patients. Hard to manage because uh, you can have a lot of blood coming into the airway uh, preventing the patient from oxygenating properly. Um, so frank blood implies a mechanical violation. Here's a test, it's called the bubble test. Um, and we were doing it yesterday in the operating room. You basically give a Valsalva while you're looking inside after you've gone on to bypass and you can clearly see air coming into the pulmonary artery. So this patient has a break in the pulmonary artery. You have to control that. You try and dissect. You can either dissect on the outside into the hilum and see if you can uh, occlude, put a clip on that specific branch where the air is coming from, see if that controls it. Sometimes you have to do an intraluminal uh, obstruction of that branch and you have to sacrifice that segment. So the management of massive airway bleeding, uh, the goal is to prevent exsanguination because they can pour a liter a minute out of their uh, airway. You want to maintain oxygenation. We can do conservative management if there's just a little bit of blood in the airway. And uh, you can just beat the blood back with uh, PEEP and uh, reversal of heparin and correction of, of uh, coagulopathies. So typically you have blood available. If it's massive bleeding, you have to use a blocker. Here we have a, um, a uni blocker that goes into the airway and we block off one of the lungs. Um, fortunately for this patient, he's doing okay. We can oxygenate on one. Sometimes you can get one and a half lung if, if you can isolate exactly which airway the bleeding is coming from and uh, then you can reverse and uh, wait for a period of time and then uh, you can take the blocker down. Occasionally the bleeding is so much that uh, you cannot oxygenate the patient and you have to completely block off the lung. If you don't have adequate oxygenation, you have to put a veno veno ECMO cannula. This is what we've done in this case here. You can see the Avalon cannula sitting here. And uh, we don't use anticoagulation at all. We completely reverse them, normalize them. And typically this heals up, the injury heals up and you can come off bypass. Hypoxemia after pulmonary endarterectomy. Um, typically it's atelectasis. Um, there might be still VQ mismatching uh, or it might be a reperfusion lung injury that causes hypoxemia. Um, I, reperfusion lung injury is a lot of debate. Okay, what is it and how exactly do you, is it uh, just hypoxemia with an infiltrate? 
hypoxemia with infiltrate uh, after 48 hours um, or is it uh, when it's after four days? There's a lot of debate, but uh, what we do know is that uh, if you see infiltrates like this, where you uh, have a whiteout uh, segment um, and uh, on the preoperative uh, area you had a mismatch that uh, you corrected, uh, this is typically a reperfusion injury and this patient might be quite hypoxemic. Um, this is the definition that we use uh, for our publications, uh, PO2 and an FO2 ratio of less than 300, uh, opacity on a chest X-ray in a region that has been endarterectomized and reperfused, and no alternative explanation for the hypoxemia. And we do know that it has clinical impact. The patients stay on the ventilator for longer, they stay in the ICU for longer, and in the hospital, and we know that the mortality is also different. Um, if, uh, there's uh, no, no injury. Um, this is uh, um, better mortality outcomes than uh, having a reperfusion lung injury. It's a high permeability edema, basically. And if you do a bronchoalveolar lavage, you're going to see a lot of neutrophils and proteins in that specimen. And we do recognize a bimodal distribution. About 60% of the cases happens immediately in the OR. Immediately you come off bypass and there's pulmonary edema coming out of the, the endotracheal tube. There's a frothy uh, sputum. And then there's another one that happens about 48 hours later and it's about 30% of reperfusion injuries present like this. Everything looks good. We actually extubate the patient. There's a couple of signs. If you see they become febrile, and the white cell count is really high, have a high suspicion that you might suddenly develop reperfusion edema, and you have to be ready. Don't send that patient to the floor, keep him in the ICU, watch him a little bit longer. And then occasionally we have seen late, like a week later, developing a reperfusion injury. How do we prevent it? We try to suppress inflammation, uh, we inhibit cytokines, inhibit neutrophils, we give big doses of steroids around the time of the surgery, and hemodynamic strategies. We try to limit the cardiac output. We try to not have like an 8, 9, 10 liter cardiac output going through that lung that's just been um, reperfused. So we use a little bit of inotropy in the beginning. We try to use dopamine, which is not as potent, and we check the cardiac output. We aim for a cardiac index of around 2.4. That's enough. You don't need more at this point in time. You can actually be harmful if you have a bigger cardiac output. And then ventilator strategies is basically uh, centered around positive pressure uh, ventilation PEEP uh, to prevent uh, the development of edema. The management, we diarise them. Sometimes we have to prone them. Steroid dosing, in nitric oxide is used for it, and occasionally we have to deploy ECMO if it uh, is severe. We have seen a, a decline in the uh, uh, incidence of uh, reperfusion uh, pulmonary edema and I don't know if it's related to the surgical techniques, the newer uh, um, bypass circuits that we have that's less uh, inflammatory but uh, clearly the incidence of it is, is going down. Just a couple of photos here uh, talking about the levels of disease. We say level one is when it's in the main pulmonary arteries where you start the dissection plane in the main pulmonary artery and that's a, a big old specimen that uh, came out of this patient. Uh, level 1 and level 2. So here you can see it's the main pulmonary artery, uh, upper lobe and lower lobe where we took it out. There's some fresh, but the important thing is getting these tails, the chronic, the white, fibrous, leathery uh, stuff out. This is level 2, started in the low bar, the dissection, and then uh, go down further. Here's some fresh clot um, that sometimes is present. It's much more difficult to remove this, but this is a chronic PE that has been present and then the patient had a me more recent uh, acute uh, embolism on top of it. Um, also a particularly challenging uh, group of uh, patients when they have fresh clot that you have to, because you cannot hold on to it. It's much easier to take out the chronic fibrous disease. Here's uh, level 2 and level 1C. 1C stands for complete occlusion, so this old thrombus completely occluded flow to the left lung and it, once we took the thrombus out deeper down there was previous incidents of uh, more chronic disease that uh, had to be removed as well. Calcifications, sometimes you, uh, uh, if it's been really long standing, the, the thrombus can actually calcify and you can see it on a CT or even on a chest x-ray. Um, more calcified disease 
also challenging because it doesn't collapse and it's not so easy to take it off. But as long as you push the patient away from the specimen, you should be able to complete the endarterectomy. More level two disease. Level three is when it's in the segmental. Um, and uh, this is level four when it's in the sub-segmental. So really small little clots. Why are they so small? Because they originated from this pacemaker, which had a inside out erosion. This is a, a Riata lead that uh, uh, developed clot on it and it uh, kept embolizing over a long period of time. We removed the, the pacemaker system and put an epicardial system in for this patient at the time of endarterectomy. This is level zero disease. So uh, here is a misdiagnosis. You can see it looks a little bit more like aorta tissue actually and it's somebody with uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension that uh, got to the surgery. You can see this is way early in the experience. We're in the 4,000 cases now. Um, we don't get to misdiagnose too, too much anymore. Um, but there's no tails. And this patient's pulmonary artery pressure was the same after the surgery and didn't do so well. Call it trousers. It's not tails, but trousers. It just ends blunt at the bottom. Uh, pacemaker clots, we already said there's a high risk, especially if it gets infected. Here's a vegetation that's uh, stuck on and uh, the patient had multiple emboli. Uh, ports, vascular ports, very frequent. Uh, if the port mold functions like this one, you can see there's clot in it, and every time he gets an injection of a drug, he first gets a, a, a nice embolism, and because this embolism sits in here for a while, it's fairly organized already, so you give him uh, level three, level four disease uh, with every injection. So we remove these ports at the time of the surgery as well. The UCSD experience, um, from 1984 and standing on the shoulders of many people that have gone before, uh, Dr. Moser, Dr. Oje, Dr. Uh, Jameson were the people that uh, really got it going for us and uh, the volume has gradually increased. We're doing around 200 cases a year at the moment and um, it seems to be this, uh, we, we, we're outgrowing the, the hospital a little bit, uh, sometimes difficult to get patients in. But I do think that this is a disease that uh, is widely prevalent and that we should have more centers that perform this. So uh, congratulations to Dr. Luer and team for starting yesterday as well. This is the mortality rate at UCSD over time. And you can see we're sitting around 2% mortality at the moment. Um, and uh, that's uh, even though we get most of the more challenging cases and complex cases get referred to us at the moment and uh, we're still trying to learn how to even manage the, um, the more difficult cases because there's not too many level 2 disease coming to us anymore. Survival. At UCSD we know that the five-year survival is uh, more than 80 percent and the whoops turned it off. Let's see if we can come back. There we go. Um, the uh, 10 year survival is uh, still 75%, so much better than lung transplant survival. This is uh, a treatment that should be offered to patients prior to lung transplant consideration. What happened to the hemodynamics? This is a, um, a systematic review by Ranavardi, uh, looking at all the publications and uh, uh, summarizing the mean pulmonary artery uh, changes from pre to post op, the pulmonary vascular resistance uh, changes, and uh, he demonstrates uh, that most authors report uh, improvement in hemodynamics, a 35% reduction in mean pulmonary artery pressure, a 1.5 to 2 liter increase in the cardiac output, 1 to 1.5 increase in the cardiac index, and pulmonary vascular resistance almost routinely decreases to around 300. Um, so very good. UCSD, pre- and post-operative, uh, this is our outcomes. This is an ongoing uh, thing, so systolic pressures uh, coming down from the from 79 to 45, the mean PA pressure 47 to 26, pulmonary vascular resistance average 897 down to 245, the cardiac uh, output goes up from 3.5 to 5.8. So really significant changes for patients. Um, but there's morbidity and mortality. Uh, here you can see that same uh, systematic review shows the mortality and it, uh, it's ranging here mostly around the 5% is a couple of uh, people that have uh, in the double digit uh, mortality rate. So is a procedure that you have to have a good team uh, and all the uh, pieces in place if you want to get good outcomes. This is how long our patients stay. 
typically they stay around 10 days in the in the hospital um, and um, it's hard to get them out much quicker they take some time they have to recover from the um, the lung injury basically during the surgery so uh, it's a little bit more longer than a, a regular cabbage uh, the survival um, here you can also see the the uh, changes in uh, functional capacity is significant improvement. Um, the six minute walk test significantly improve after the surgery. And then the survival also in the systematic review has been reported as very good. Predictors of worse outcome, age, if they're older, if they need valve surgery, if they need bypass surgery at the same time, uh, if they have a very high preoperative uh, PVR, more distal disease, if they come into the OR with a high right atrial pressure, female gender has a higher risk uh, for the surgery, and uh, if you don't use deep hypothermic circulatory arrest, and room saturation coming to the uh, operating room at 85% or presence of comorbidities, has all been by different authors identified as risk factors. We already mentioned this slide, the higher the PVR, the higher the risk, but what about post-operative or residual pulmonary hypertension? From the Papworth group, we know that uh, they looked at the outcomes and uh, um, they follow patients back at three months and they found that 31% had residual pulmonary hypertension. So still pretty significant, which was a mean PA pressure of more than 30. Uh, they found that these patients had worse exercise capacity, had more symptoms than the patients who did not have residual pulmonary hypertension, but their survival at five years was similar to the patients who had no pulmonary hypertension. So they might still be somewhat limited, but they are uh, most probably going to have a survival benefit um, in the long run. Residual pulmonary hypertension, so it's 15 to 35, what, do you, what can you do? Treatments for it. In the ICU, use inotropes, you support the circulation. You can use inhaled nitric <coughs> oxide, iloprost or epoprostenol. We very seldom use it. We normally try to diurese the patient, use the inotropes, and then gradually wean it. As, uh, as the lung remodels and the ventricle remodels. So in conclusion then, the pulmonary endarterectomy is and remain the treatment of choice for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Uh, we get excellent short and long-term outcomes that can be achieved as long as we adhere to the surgical principles. Um, in the future, I think we need more high quality prospective data uh, to just make sure that uh, we have good safety, that we can uh, approve the e efficacy and identify more prognostic factors. This is actually still, despite the almost 30 year history of the disease at UCSD, not uh, widely disseminated throughout the whole country. And uh, I think we need to uh, work hard on having a multi in, in, uh, uh, institutional registry, which now does exist, and uh, hopefully we're going to soon get more data. Thank you very much. Happy to entertain questions.